But anyways, my name is Derek Distonfield. I am the co-founder of GSD Venture Studios. Um, and I'm here with my partner, Gary Fowler. What we're going to do today is um, Gary is going to speak to you about um, the mindset that's needed to become a global company. Um, and then I'm going to speak to you about some tactical and operational things um, that you guys should focus on. Um, Gary, my partner and co-founder, is really needs no introduction. Um, and he certainly will be able to introduce himself much better than, than you guys. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick it over to Gary Fowler, my partner. Yeah, great. Thanks, Derek. Great to be here and great to, uh, to uh, see you. I see Darmash, Danash, Walter, Oha. Great to have you here. My name is Gary Fowler and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done 17 companies and I've been involved in two unicorns. I was on the original management team of Click Software, sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion, a little less than four years ago, and also EBA.ai, an AI HR tech company that I co-founded. Uh, I love artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and also uh, uh, cybersecurity, among other things, because AI is really the new electricity. So I wanted to talk to you about what it takes, and I've been doing startups for over 35 years. My first startup I did when I was 21 years old. I remember when I got started with that project, you know, people said that um, you wouldn't be able to do it. Why would you waste your time, including my father? But each and every one of you, Oha, Darmash, Arnab, you've got to go out and you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to have an unwavering belief that you can do it. And I did a TEDx talk a few years ago about exactly this. I called POV, passion, optimism, and visualization. So one of, what are the reasons that, you know, if you look at a startup entrepreneurs, why do they fail? Because they start to lose confidence in their ability to be able to execute. They, use, they lose confidence in the team that they have. But in reality, you got to look yourself in the mirror. You got to say to yourself, you need to own that responsibility. One is you've got to be passionate about what you have, your product, service, and the journey that you're going to take. Because it isn't easy. There are always ups and downs and ins and outs when you're building a company. But that's part of it. You know, I look at it as it's kind of like an Indiana Jones movie, an old movie from a, many years ago. And it's really one of the chapters in that movie. So passion is very important. Love what you do. So if you listen to some of the greatest entrepreneurs out there, you know, people like Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, they just love what they did. Love it. Second thing is you need to be optimistic. And why do I say that? Because if you look at the glasses being uh, half full, it goes back and, you know, Mother Teresa said, it's not about stopping more. It's about pro-peace. You've got to have an optimistic. You've got to believe that you can accomplish it. Because if you don't believe it, as an entrepreneur, your team's not going to believe it. You have to believe that you can accomplish it. If you're going to uh, climb Mount Everest, you got to believe that you can accomplish it. If you're going to take a company to an IPO, you got to believe that you're able to do that. So optimism is, is absolutely fundamentally uh, important. So is it easy? Absolutely not. You know, they talk about pivots. So pivots, when you hit a roadblock, you know, you have a, a challenge and the situation is, what do you do? Do you stop? No, you got to look at another direction when you're driving your car down the street. And as you're driving your car down the street, you understand you made the wrong turn or you didn't make a turn and you've got to make a U-turn. Is it wrong? Is that the failure? Absolutely not. You're just course correcting. So you got to retweak it in your mind that what you're doing is, you're just correcting. And when you're doing a startup, that's part of the journey. That's part of the mindset. That's part of the idea. And you need to really visualize where you want to go. Paint mental pictures of where you want to go and what you want to do. And I always do that. Paint the picture. 
And when you start to paint those pictures, you know, it's a Pygmalion effect, the self-fulfilling prophecy. What I'm talking about is the soft side of being able to be a great entrepreneur. So you need to visualize where you want to go, what you want to do. What does that mean? Put it up. What kind of people do you need to meet? You know, a lot of doing a startup is about networking, just like we're doing today with the right kind of people at the right place at the right time. People that can add value to your company. People, people that can help you move forward. People that can give you the right kind of advising and, and contacts. The other thing with the pandemic in front of us and behind us, we've got challenges, right? We were in, here we are on um, a Zoom, right? I remember six years ago when I was one of the first Zoom users and people said, ah, nobody's gonna use this, but look at it today. This is the way we conduct business. Use your technology wisely. Use the technology as you visualize to be able to connect the dots, connect the dots with people, go to events, you know, go these online events, just like we're having here today. It's really important. Talk about what your dream is. Talk about the ways that you're able to change the world. You know, Guy Kawasaki, who's a good friend, once told me that, that enchanting people, getting them excited, painting pictures with words is one of the most fundamentally important thing of being an entrepreneur. I believe that that's true too. Paint the pictures with words. When you're developing your startup, you got to make sure that people feel what you're trying to achieve. Literally feel it. So what does that mean? That means the taglines that you have need to be able to be felt. They need to be able to feel them in their heart and soul. They need to understand the problem and more importantly, that you can solve that problem. So these are the kind of, some of the pieces that are really important. And of course, building the right kind of minds to the, the right kind of team. When you're building your team, you want to make sure that you have people that have complementary skill sets, people that can that are diverse, that can add value to you and your company, people that look at things in a different way. I always say, from my standpoint, you need to have three pieces, and I've written an article in Forbes about it. One is you need to be uh, diverse. You need to have intergenerational teams. By that, I mean you need people with experience. You know, we talk about the the under thirty year olds developing or under 25 year olds developing a company, but you need that credibility to be able to take it to those levels, to take it to a unicorn level. So look at the intergenerational team, look at your advisors that can give you credibility and help you build your company, because that's going to be really important as you're going down through this, this, this uh, journey. The other thing is you want to make sure that, that you've got uh, decentralized uh, teams. You've got teams located, get the right place at the right right price at the right place at the right time. By that, I mean, make sure your R&D work is done in the right kind of location. And <clears throat> again, your job as the, the leader, as a founder of the company, is to be able to lead those groups and all the things that I talked about, passion, optimism, visualization, you need to convey it. But you also need to convey it as Derek's going to talk about in a little bit in a very operational kind of way. So they understand where they need to go, what they need to do, and how they need to get there. At the same time, you got to give them the flexibility to do it their way and the way that the and take that input and put it in as part of the plan and understand it. Listen, as I said, it's it's not easy when you're going down through this journey, which each and every one of you are going down through today. It's about keeping that that the right kind of attitude to be able to get that get the job done. At the same time, you know, take a, take some time out of your schedule and, you know, do something that is enjoyable for you. And, I've, and I'm not saying that lightly. So if you like to uh, ride a bike or play tennis or something, take a few minutes out of your schedule and do something that's refreshing to get your mind away from it and then come back. So uh, contacts are really important today having the right kind of advisors are really important today. Look at people. What are the, some of the topics that people think about you know, within their companies today? Cybersecurity, security. So make sure that you've got advisors, that you're connecting the right kind of advisors that have those kind of uh, backgrounds uh, and credibility for your company. People that have, I call it the rule of threes, people that have you know, those uh, uh, IIT uh, degrees, the Stanford degrees, the Harvard degrees, the Oxford degrees,
degrees, just somebody that has those contacts, look at somebody that's a venture capitalist or somebody's got has been successful as an entrepreneur for the for the number two uh, advisory role. And number three situation is somebody that's just done it. Somebody that's had incredible success that can show that you're in touch with the market the way it is today. And I see we have, uh, you know, um, India electric vehicle company, uh, you know, uh, look at where some of the trends are gone. You know, things like um, today as we're, as we're talking about um, electric motorcycles, electric cars, electric bicycles. I mean, this is a journey that's gonna take place incredibly fast uh, during each and every one of you's lifetime. As we move from fossil-based fuels, look at those trends. You know, keep your eyes open. You gotta keep the curiosity of a child. Right. As you're looking at at the market, keep that your eyes open and keep stay curious because things like these electric vehicles, um, motorcycles, bicycles, bicycles. I've worked with uh, Mahindra and Gen Z and um, the CEO of that group here in the States. These are emerging technologies. Look at it. Look what the trends are. Look what the next five trends are going to be and study it deeply. If you're dealing with motorcycles, look at what, uh, or bicycles or cars, look at where some of the trends are, the density of batteries, um, the type of systems, how fast you can build it, how cheap you can build it, where you can build it. Just start to do your research on it, dive into it a bit. It'll help you when you're doing your presentations. This will help you a lot for your presentations to the investors and to the other partners that are out there today. It'll help you to understand where your company needs to go and what it needs to do and helps you develop what I call a 360 degree view. Remember again, there's uh, 8.1 billion people on the planet earth today, growing to 13 billion. There's a lot of issues that we need to resolve. There's a credible amount of data that's around each and every one of us, about 49 zettabytes. If you took CDs or DVDs and stacked them one on top of another, it would go 35 times between the earth and the moon. We are inundated with data. Think about it in your own personal lives, how many times a week somebody says, you know, uh, Dharmash or Oha, I send it um, email. Well, when did you send it? I sent it two weeks ago. Um, where did you send it? I sent it to your Gmail account. Uh, can you send it again? I can't find it. We are in a state of infobesity. So data is critically important. Understanding that data and the kind of impact on your life, whether it's supply chain, whether it's healthcare, whether it's space technologies, whether it's electric vehicles for optimization, et cetera. But AI is the new electricity and AI is gonna radically change our lives. And then with quantum computing, you wanna look at, you know, quantum computer can be a hundred million times faster than a supercomputer. That means what would take 10,000 years on a supercomputer takes 200 seconds on a quantum. For each and every one of your companies that are out there, these technologies are gonna be important so figure out how at one point in time you can incorporate them in, especially today with uh, AI and, and machine learning. Not just talking about it, but actually how it can make, actually make a difference and put you ahead of the competition. So um, I think that I'm coming up to the top of the hour. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. There's a chat here. Um, if you've got questions, just let me know. Questions? No questions. Okay. Well, yeah, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. We'll take to... we'll take them at the end. They'll, okay. Maybe I'll. So I just want to uh, say thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join me here today. Derek will uh, be next. Appreciate the time. Stay safe. Stay happy, and keep smiling. Take care. Thank you. Derek? I'm here. Can you see me? Yes. All right, cool. All right, let me. All right, everyone. Um, 
Again, my name is Derek Distenfield. I am the co-founder of GSD Venture Studios. And I wanted to give um, some tips on, on how to go global. Um, before I do that, um, GSD Venture Studios, just so you guys know, we're a cross-border venture studio. So we travel the world um, looking for bold, resilient entrepreneurs, um, including India, including 23 other countries we've worked with in our portfolio. Um, and, ooh, my slides are out of order. But very quickly about me, prior to starting GSD Venture Studios, I've worked in several technology startups from $0 failures to $2 billion exits and pretty much everything in between. I always tell people that I'm not intelligent, I'm just driven. Um, so I'm not an engineer, but I've held most roles in terms of product growth and, and operations. I also, for context, started, built, and sold a storytelling marketing firm. So I'm hyper passionate about simplifying experience for users, but also simplifying the messaging that Gary spoke about earlier. The last thing that I did is I helped start an accelerator in the United States where I seeded 350 companies that went on to raise $99 million in, in venture capital. So between the ventures with 24 countries that we've done with GSD Venture Studios, the 350 startups I've seeded, and then the ones that I've been a part of, I have, I don't know everything, but I have a lot of battle scars and experiences that I hope I can talk about today. Um, and so I see one uh, question in the chat and feel free to keep asking them and then I'll, I'll try to get to them um, at some point before I stop. But the, sorry about my slides. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, like going global is a little bit of a cliche. Um, and right now it's even harder in times of COVID. And so the first thing that I wanted to exclaim is that leading in times of uncertainty ultimately comes down to effective communication. The challenge is, and the crazy part about that statement is, God, I'm really sorry. Okay. Very anti-dramatic. Okay. The, the problem with that statement is when I was doing some research um, around problems with communication, I found that there was 58 million articles and it's crazy because we've been talking about effective communication since the times of Aristotle. And with all this communication training and thoughts and ideas, we still struggle with it across all societies. And it's vital to being a leader every day, but it's even more vital in times like COVID. But what I would say is COVID's not going to go away anytime soon. I mean, I do think it will get better, but the impact is going to be lasting. Um, but next month or next year or whatever, there's going to be another crisis. And there's always going to be something where it requires you to communicate effectively. Now, before we get crazy, if you think I have the silver bullet of how to communicate effectively, um, I'm sorry, I don't. And it, it's just impossible. But the one tip I do have is that not everyone is an extrovert. Gary is a phenomenal speaker. He can naturally talk in front of others. He's very extroverted. 
and, and that works for him and that's his leadership style. But there's many people that are introverted and you shouldn't be pushed out of being a CEO and a leader because you have a lot to offer. And just because you might not lead by speaking or being vocal in front of others, there is another way to do it. And I would say that it's writing. And I think that if you want to have a global company, you need to either A, be an effective communicator in person or in writing. It needs to be one or the other. And I would encourage you to hone one of those two things because you're either rallying the troops and having an open mic, whether it's virtual or in person, or you're doing it with your writing. And one of those has got to be honed and be effective. The second thing that I wanna talk about in terms of leadership is something that Gary touched on. But I wanna do it in terms of a story. There is a famous paradox in, in the book, Good to Great, which is a best-selling book on business. And the Stockdale Paradox is actually named after a former US Navy Admiral. And it was named after Admiral Stockdale. And Admiral Stockdale was captured in the Vietnam War. He was actually the highest ranking member that was captured in the Vietnam War. And he was brought to the most difficult, torturous camp in Vietnam. And he was tortured along with others for many, many months. And many people did not survive, but Admiral Stockdale did. And when he returned to the United States, he went and got his PhD and studied why some people died and why some people survived. And what Admiral Stockdale believes is that there's actually two things that you need to survive in those difficult times. The first thing is you must have the unbelievable confidence that you will succeed. You must take Gary Fowler's advice and believe that you will succeed. However, it must be coupled with the fact and the understanding of the realistic situation on the ground. So in, in, the, in the death camp, the ones, the soldiers that said, I'm gonna be home by Christmas, or I'm gonna definitely be home by my wife's birthday. Those were the ones that did not survive. But the ones that said, I'm not going to be home by Christmas, I might not be home for a year, I might not be home for two years, but I know that I can survive are the ones that were able to. And certainly going global is not a life or death situation, but I believe that if you keep the paradox in mind, it will help your startup live and prosper and give yourself the opportunity to go global. So yes, COVID is bad. Yes, it's impacting your business. Yes, it is hard to scale in these times, but you must have that realistic view, but also that strong confidence that you will succeed. That's the Stockdale paradox. The second thing and the second behavior that I would encourage is to act like an ER doctor, not a neurosurgeon. Act like an ER doctor, not a neurosurgeon. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go in for brain surgery, a neurosurgeon is going to usually operate under a microscope. He's going to take his time. He's going to go very, very slow. He is going to stop 
and maybe take x-rays or ask an expert for advice. And he is going to make sure that he has all the information that he, he needs even before he starts and during the surgery. He is going to stay widely informed. An ER doctor does not do that. An ER doctor has to make quick decisions, usually only has 50 to 60% of the information he or she needs. Now is the time where you make quick decisions. I would much rather make 100 decisions in a day and 70 of them be right than only make one or two. If you want to become a global, global company, that means you want to compete on a global scale. That means that you must be comfortable making fast decisions. Gary talked about an advisory circle, and he talked about the rule of threes um, that we recommend at GSD Venture Studios. But I, I want to expand on that a little bit more. Your advisory board should include people that have recently done what you're seeking advice on. So, and I don't mean, when I, just to be clear, I don't mean a board of advisors for your company. I mean an advisory circle of people that can help you and support you. And what I advocate for is the understanding that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have a clue on how to raise an A round. And even if he did, the amount of time that it would take for you to get Mark Zuckerberg's attention or the CEO of Tata's attention, and then ask him or her how to raise an A round, which is something they haven't done for 10, 15 years, does not make a heck of a lot of sense. I would much rather, if I was raising an A round, look for somebody that raised one six months ago that has the most relevant information on the ground about how to get an A round raised. If I was trying to take my company from $50,000 a month to a million dollars a month, I would find somebody who had done that and not look for those superstars that did it many years ago. Because the problem with those superstars is the amount of time that it takes to get in touch with them and the amount of time that they can devote versus their actual knowledge on what you need and the stage you're in, there's just not going to be a big enough payoff. And so find an advisory circle of people that you can call or have on WhatsApp that have recently been there and done that. Those are the ones that you need in these kind of times. One of the things, if you want to build a global company that we focus a lot on is what is the job of the CEO? And one of the things that, and one of the reasons why we believe you need a co-founder and I know that there's so much written and talked about finding co-founders. But one of the reasons we believe that startups should have co-founders is the job of a CEO is not to manage. The job of the CEO is three, maybe four things, but no more. The first thing that the CEO must do is set the mission, the vision, and the values of the organization. And that is both internally and externally. And to Gary's point, you should feel it. You should believe it. You should live it as the CEO. The second job of the CEO is to recruit and maintain talent who ultimately does manage. And then the third thing is keep the company alive. And to some of you, that means fundraising. To someone like me, it means beg, borrow, deal. 
I mean, maybe there's another one, whatever it takes <laughs> to keep that company alive. Now, at the earliest stages, there's a fourth thing is if there's something that you are an expert at already, like you're a developer already, or you have a background in sales, you can add that at the earliest stages, but that is it. And that is all the CEO should do. And this is hard. And so this is why if you're a one founder company, it is hard to master these three things, maybe half of another um, all by yourself and, and run the company. Like there's no room for that to happen. Um, the next thing that I think needs to be remembered is you must have white space on your calendar to go global. And this advice may make sense to you and, or it may not, but what we're all seeing as a result of Zoom is everything is Zoom, 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 Zoom. And if you took a look at my calendar and probably some of your calendars, it would be completely filled up and there'd be no white space. There'd be no blanks. Well, what I had to start doing was filling in those blanks ahead of time because you need time to think, you need time to communicate, you need time to write and to plan. And so if you don't have the white space to prepare and execute your Go Global plan and you just do Zoom, 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 you're never going to get the time you need to go global. You're never gonna be able to communicate with your team, whether you're a writer doing it via blogs and memos and emails or in person, you got to save white space for that because if you don't, you will not succeed. Okay. One of the biggest challenges that Gary and I see every day at GSD Venture Studios is we see amazing products Every day, Gary and I see amazing products, amazing startups, amazing ideas. There's two ways that people build amazing products. The first way is they have a lot of expertise in something. Let's just say you're really, really good at cricket. You've been playing cricket since you were a little boy. You were on the best teams as a child. You were on the best teams as a, an adult. You may have even played professionally. And what you realized was that there is a new kind of glove to wear <laughs> to prevent you from getting blisters. It's a magic glove and it will make you hit the ball better than anyone in the world. And you also have a friend that makes the leather for this magic glove and you can get it at a discount cheaper than anywhere else. And you also have a co-founder that is an expert at sewing it and manufacturing it and you make the glove. That's how I see so many startups get started, but it's wrong because the first step should not be to make what you can sell or not to make what you can build, but to make what you can sell. And so make what you can sell, don't build what you know how to make. And so in order for this to come true, you must talk to customers and fall in love with the problem, not the solution. If the problem of that cricket startup was you wanna hit the ball farther, fall in love with that, talk to customers and find what they're willing to buy to hit the ball farther. If the problem is you wanna prevent blisters, we'll fall in love with the problem, 
don't immediately go to a batting glove just because you can get leather at a discount and you know someone that can sew it for you. Talk to customers. Another point where I see not getting done enough, especially in software, is people do not talk to their users while they're using it. And you're like, well, how could I possibly do that? Why is it that you cannot say to a user, especially if it's a business to business product that I want to come do the install for you? Putting safety aside, but why? I, I say this all the time. You can offer a concierge install and you can go watch them do it and help them do it and see how they actually are using the product. You can do it on the consumer side too. It's a little harder, but it is so worth it to watch people using your software, finding ways to do it. You've got to fall in love with the problem, fall in love with the customers, not the solution. And I, I can't tell you how many times I see outstanding solutions, but it's not aligned to a customer. So in terms of talking to customers, I just want to reiterate, I hate surveys. I, I don't think they're helpful at all. I think, um, you know, I, I think some people could argue with me and, you know, maybe if you're Facebook and you send a survey, you can get enough data to correlate, but I would much rather watch five customers use a product than email 500 people a survey and ask them their thoughts. One of the things that I think people don't focus enough on is in the early stages to the late stages, when things are hard, such as during COVID, you have to sometimes do things that don't scale. And in the United States, we have a saying that cash is king. And you have to find a way to get people to pay upfront or more in advance. So if you have a software as a service company, you know, get two year subscriptions, um, you know, find a way to get discounts where they're paying up front and paying um, and getting you cash. The best companies in the world, like Amazon in the US, follow the money. Yes, you need to talk to customers. Yes, you need to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. But you also need to fall in love with money and follow where that money is and get the money. That is ultimately the goal. And what I mean by that is pay attention to Gary's point, to trends. Where is the money going? Where is the money being paid? Like, I got to tell you, if you had a human resources company during the peak of COVID and you're calling up CEOs saying, hey, do you want to buy my human resources product? That really shows that you were not acting like a, an ER doctor. You are not following the money because chances are a CEO does not need that at that right in time. So if you have an HR company during the, the peak of COVID, you know that you need to have an all hands on deck huddle or communicate via email if you're an introvert. And you and your team need to find a way to offer to follow the money. And where is the money now? What could we offer our customers present and future of something they need? Okay, another thing that I wanna talk about is a process that I used 
with my marketing firm and I still use with startups today. So I ran a marketing firm called Cult Following. It was a metaphor to a religious cult. And we built online and offline communities and ecosystems for brands. And we took brands through a three-stage process that we called recruit, indoctrinate, spread. And I think that it is a great way to build a global company. And I want to show you some examples, okay? The, the first example is a company called Hire Club. So Hire Club is a website in the United States that helps people find a job. They offer coaching services, whether it be how to negotiate during the interview process with your resume, et cetera. It's, it's actually a pretty kind of vanilla concept. But what Hire Club did is they went through the recruit, indoctrinate, spread process. And so what Hire Club did before they built a website, before they built a blog or a single ad, they built a Facebook group. And they built a community of Facebook users that was had two sides to it. One, it was people looking for jobs. And two, it was people fulfilling jobs. And they built an authentic, real, genuine community. And they had tight rules. And they really knew, you know, we really focused on how to build that community. And that's the recruit. So number one is recruit a community. They recruited a community of over 35,000 people. And they did it by just providing value, being authentic, being real, and asking nothing in return. Now, some of you guys are saying, well, this guy's not being helpful. I don't know how to build a community. Like, how do you build a community? And this certainly isn't a class on how to build a community, but what I would submit to you is the same problems that you have building a community are the same challenges you're going to have in getting attention for your startup. And so why not start and practice and hone those customer acquisition skills with your community? So step one is you recruit. These guys recruited 35,000 people looking for jobs and people providing jobs. And they had greater interaction. Um, so they recruited them, they indoctrinated them. And then they spread by launching their website. And that's where you get to the revenue model. And so they were able to grow their idea first through a Facebook page, then providing value on the Facebook page and then launching their website. And now they're doing about six or 700 K in MRR every month, but all started from that community. Another example on the consumer side is a Instagram page called Meme Queen. And so this page recruited users on Instagram, mostly a female audience. They provided value with memes and comedy and um, excitement and engagement. And then their spread is interesting. It's less defined find than higher club but they launch a product a different consumer product every month so they have a sleep app they have blankets they have makeup um and this is a multi-million dollar brand that stems from six million raging followers that they recruited 
provide value with comedy and then they trust them to buy their products. And so I would submit that, you know, these two concepts that I'm, I'm citing as examples that follow the cult following framework are not the only ones that do this. Um, the other companies, if you think about it, like if you've heard of Twilio, which is a US company, Salesforce, another US company, they all build communities and ecosystems, create value for those ecosystems, and then they could almost sell them almost anything they want. And I once heard a piece of advice, which I, I do try to follow, but it's a little harder in practice, but I think it should resonate, is if you just look for one raving fan, raving fan every day and build that and build your startup around that, it will help you immensely. Because the definition of a raving fan is a fan that will buy at least once of everything you're selling. And you don't need that many raving fans to be successful. If you look at Slack, the messaging application, they have a lot of people that love them. They have about eight or 9 million users, but they only really have 2 billion raving fans that are paying for Slack. And that took them to an IPO and then an acquisition from Salesforce. And they're clearly a global company. So think about building that community. Another piece of advice is when I was growing up in the 1990s in, in the US, there is a famous clothing line called FUBU, F-O-B-U. And FUBU stand, stood for For Us, By Us. So when you're thinking of communities, think of ones that you already belong to or can associate with and um, sell to that community. So if you're a developer, you know, for developers, by developers. If you're a salesperson, for salespeople, by salespeople. You know, if you're a young, fashionable woman, such as the owner of Mean Queen. It's for young, fashionable women, for fashionable women. And so creating that for us, by us can be a unique value proposition in your story to follow up on Gary's point on how you could resonate with people. So um, the thing that I want to say is that there are plenty of companies from emerging markets that have been able to go global. Here's just simply five of them. I know what some of you are saying is, well, that's only five. Well, here's a list of several more. And I'm confident that you do it too, if you believe and lead in a realistic fashion in uncertain times. Um, so, the last thing that I want to say is um, I'm the founder of GSD Venture Studios. We also have GSD Labs, which is a cross-border accelerator. But first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. And I've been an entrepreneur since I was seven years old. And so I will help any company at any stage in any way I can. I promise you, if Gary or I do not know the answer, we can get somebody that can. And so um, please contact me. I all, here's my email here. Um, I also in the chat put my link to me. You can reach out that way. Um, so whatever the question is, I'm happy to help. Um, the other thing is I'm also happy to take any instruction or any questions. You guys were previously muted before. Um, if you're able to now unmute yourself if you like, or you could type it in the chat, whatever makes you most comfortable. But you can ask me anything you want. And I challenge someone to go first. If someone goes first, the others will follow.
No questions? All right. Um, well, like I said, um, my link tree is in the chat. I'll email out this deck to everyone so you you have it and um, believe in yourself and believe in your dreams and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, Derek. Bye. Thank you, Gary. Thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. All right. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. And thank you to o thank you. Oh, yeah, You guys should go. Great hotels and great working spaces. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much. Hoping to yeah, host nice. you someday if you're in India. Oh, absolutely. We'll be coming yes. soon. Yes. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Yes.